Hello, everybody. Thank you, Seattle Science Foundation, for allowing me to give this talk. I really appreciate the invitation. So what I'm going to describe today are just 10 features that applicants should consider when they're ranking a spine surgery fellowship. As a background, my residency was at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital, where I did an orthopedic surgery residency. I had great views, great friends. That's actually a view from, uh, from where I lived for five years. Then I did my spine surgery fellowship at the Rothman Orthopedic Institute. I was able to interview at many, many places, and so it kind of gives me somewhat of a grasp on other programs. Um, Philadelphia was great, had great co-fellows, less great views in Miami, um, but we had gritty, and that was a key part. Uh, now I'm in private practice. I'm in a five-person spine surgery group where my views now consist of surgery, my partners, as well as my beautiful children and wife. So in general, I've kind of come up with this list of 10, and most importantly, this is not the order of importance. But the things I want to go over today are the number of co-fellows in the program, ACGME accreditation, exposure to MIS, and that's going to be a debate. Like, what is MIS? Exposure to technology. This includes augmented reality, robotics, navigation, the mentorship you get, um, the call, spine trauma, the location, is that even important? Research opportunities, household name recognition, as well as deformity opportunities. The number of co-fellows is a pretty interesting factor. You could be just by yourself on an island, or you could have three co-fellows for a total uh, program size of four. In general, there's many pros and cons to both of these examples. The benefits of a larger program is it really does imply that they have a large volume. They have multiple attendings who are very skilled and they need that many co-fellows and they can support that many co-fellows. This also applies that maybe you have a lot more surgical autonomy. They have so much volume that they need this help. It definitely can, um, it definitely can accommodate this much help. The other nice part is it's kind of a nice support system you have through fellowship, but most importantly, as I've learned several years out, is it's a really great network you have even after fellowship. I don't want to be calling Chris Kepler every time I have a problem. He's going to think I'm an idiot. So instead, I'm able to talk to my co-fellows and kind of bounce problems off of them or even just kind of um, see how their practice is going. It's a really nice alumni network as well as support system. But the smaller programs have a benefit also. You know, you get all of the volume. If there's crazy cases going on that week and you're stuck on some service where you don't get to do those, well, maybe in these smaller programs, you can kind of cherry pick. You can do the great cases and the cases that you want to do. And that's a huge advantage maybe. But of course, there's some drawbacks to the programs. You know, if it's a very large program, maybe that's less time you're taking call. And that actually could be a bad thing. You know, call is good. Maybe you're co-scrubbing cases with your fellows, which is nice every now and then just to kind of operate with someone at your skill level. But, um, you know, it's nice maybe being the only ship in town and you running all the stuff yourself. But the smaller programs, maybe they rely on you. Maybe you're kind of stuck doing all of the work and there's no time for yourself. Um, another thought to think about is the ACG accreditation. And this is kind of a interesting topic. So in the arthroplasty, as well as the sports fellowships, almost all of them are accredited and that's pretty standard. But in spine, maybe it's about 50% of them. In theory, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's ACG me accredited or not. Some of the differences could be that if it's not ACG me accredited, then if you're a fellow, you could actually be a junior attending. So you have just as much status as some of the, your mentors there. And maybe a potential benefit of this is that you can time out cases on your own. You could start the case. If you're timing out the case just yourself, well, that's great. That's just more autonomy. That's the ability to maybe run two rooms or even three or four rooms based on the different laws of that city and state to where you can have multiple cases going on. And that's all about the autonomy. That's all about you getting more exposure kind of on your own. Um, and it's also nice for managing overnight traumas. Again, your attendings may be more likely to let you manage that trauma overnight um, if they don't have to come in necessarily. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be doing complex corpectomies or PCDFs on your own, but if it's a washout or something like that, even that helps build surgical autonomy. So the accreditation programs, you know, you're still probably getting significant volume. You're still probably getting very much hands-on experience. Probably the only difference is they have different work hour rules, but it's probably similar to residency where it's just up to you to report those work hours um, if needed. And I'll kind of leave it at that. Consider is exposure to MIS surgery. And when I say MIS, I'm talking about minimally invasive T lifts, fusions, perk screws, 
laterals. I think laterals are an MIS surgery. Endoscopic. Those are all really important things that are becoming more and more widespread, popular, and standard of care in some, in some types of surgeries. From my standpoint, I think becoming good at laterals is important. Some programs, they don't do laterals, and I'm not specifically talking about left side up versus prone, but it'd be great to get an exposure to both of those. Uh, other aspects could be who's doing the approach for them. I know some fellowship programs, they have their general surgery do the approach to laterals. And really, you know, the hard part isn't necessarily putting the cage in, it's the exposure getting to that area. It's the comfort level, it's finding the psoas, it's getting through the psoas safely or anterior to the psoas are the key part on lateral surgeries. Another aspect of lateral surgeries are endoscopic or tubular surgeries. Are you gonna be comfortable using a tube? Are you gonna be comfortable using an endoscope, looking at a screen? Those are both, uh, I'm not debating which one's better, tube, non-tube, or endo, but I do think it's important to just have the understanding of how to use those, and most importantly, which patients might be better indicated for those type of surgery, endoscopic, tube, um, I'm not saying you're going to leave practice being great at the endoscope, but it'd be really great to at least see it. Another thing to talk about on MIS is percutaneous screws. There are some programs that are very traditional, wide open surgeries, flaying open all the muscle, and that's not necessarily a bad way to do it in certain pathologies, but it'd be great if the fellow was able to get exposure to perk screws, maybe even doing deformity with perk screws, getting comfortable under the microscope placing the cage and then perk screws on the other side. Those are all key things. I also think it's helpful to have a good understanding without navigation doing perk screws, getting to that medial wall, getting to the posterior wall of the pedicle or the vertebral body. Those are key parts that I think understanding your fluoroscopy really helps you as a spine surgeon once you're kind of graduated. Another concept you should be looking for when you're selecting programs and ranking them is what's their exposure like to technology? When I say technology, I'm talking about some of the newer things navigation technology. And I'm talking about both freehand as well as robotic navigation. What about augmented reality? Are these programs that are working with industry to develop some of these newer technologies? So you're somewhat on the cutting edge and you're seeing some of these new technologies coming out. You know, doing robotic spine surgery isn't necessarily extremely hard because the robot definitely helps with some of that skill set. But some of the important things to notice are just the room setup for these navigation what side to have the robot on? Where should the C-arm or the O-arm come from? When you're doing the headset, when's the best time to either break scrub or have the um, augmented reality people come put the headset on? These are just things that you need to recognize when things make sense and don't make sense when you're relying on this technology. Another aspect about the technology is the ability to market it, and that could be something that you could be learning while you're there as a fellow. Okay, this is one of the more important ones to talk about spine call and spine trauma. A key part of this is not necessarily just having that exposure, but it's having that additional case volume, as well as understanding the various implications of either waiting to the next day to take care of something, what needs an operative intervention, what needs to be worked up further before you take it back to the operating room, how to deal with polytrauma situations. These are all pretty high stress things, and it's very nice to have an attending or a mentor to help guide you through some of these high stress things. You can have patients with significant abscesses from IV drug use. You can have patients with tumors resulting in significant traumas. You know, not all trauma is car wrecks or falling off ladders. A lot of it could be infection that's causing either cord or certain uh, fecal sac compression, tumors creating unstable fractures. Those are key things to be focusing on and having a good trauma experience, one, gives you more volume, Two, potentially gives you more autonomy in terms of maybe the fellow is taking care of some of those cases. And uh, four, it just helps you become more confident in your skill sets. Another interesting aspect about taking call is that it helps you understand how to manage spinal cord injuries. And I think it's interesting to see how your attendings talk to families or loved ones of those who've experienced the trauma, who've experienced the spinal cord injuries. Having a, there's not necessarily recorded videos that you can watch, so having that hands-on experience of walking with your attending, walking with your mentor to either deliver good news or sometimes bad news is an important aspect of exposure that you might get in more trauma-heavy, call-heavy programs. It's also interesting to work with um, emergency room doctors, residents, even medical students, and even floor nurses that help give you some of the information about these trauma or call cases able to kind of find different pieces of the puzzle helps you make your informed decision. 
Another consideration when you're ranking your programs is to focus on the mentorship, on the attendings they have. It's great to have attendings who have been doing this for a long time, who are very well known, who are more connected in the spine societies, because they can maybe help you get connected to those societies. They can give you their historical evidence that they've been working with. They can give you different exposures that you might not normally have. Um, they're leaders in the field. Sometimes you even have rising stars in the field, and that's great. These are all pe also people that can give you kind of life lessons. Maybe outside of the spine world, they've had certain trials and tribulations in their life, and they can help guide you how to avoid those things or how to deal with those things if they come up. It's also pretty uh, interesting and very flattering to think about. These are some of the most famous spine surgeons in the world, and they are essentially blessing you with the opportunity to operate on their patients, and they are trusting you at a certain point and at a certain time to help manage some of these patients that are coming to see them. This is another interesting factor to consider, but I personally don't think it's that big of a factor. It's the location. It's where this program is. Now look, most fellowships are just one year. If it was a five-year thing or a seven-year thing, that's obviously a pretty big deal. But for one year, you can kind of live anywhere. For me personally, I lived in Philadelphia. This was a great experience for me. I'm a Texan native, lived in Texas or Dallas most of my life. And so living in the Northeast for a while was great. It taught me a whole lot of things. I got to meet a whole lot of personalities. I got to see what Philadelphia uh, Eagles fans are really like, and it was just a great experience. So I'd look at it as an advantage, but I wouldn't necessarily have that be a big factor when you're ranking the programs, because look, it's just one year. The research opportunities you get in that program could be a big deal. It could not be a big deal. It's all based on kind of what you're coming in looking for. Um, there's many of these programs, you know, the reason they have a fellowship is usually because they also have a research powerhouse probably. And so there could be an avenue to where either you or you could help coordinate with the med students or residents there to get a lot of publications done. This could be a source after your fellowship also to be a source of continued publications, continued collaborations. It's also an avenue to get to uh, speaking engagements or podiums, as well as access to different conferences or podiums. So it's a factor. It all depends on how important that is for you. Uh, some people might not care about research. Some people that's pretty important to them. Again, it's a factor and just kind of varies on where that is in your life based on how you should rank that. So this is probably everybody's favorite topic, right? Deformity, big, tough patients, big, tough complications. You know, the key thing about deformity, I kind of jokingly say, most fellows know how to put in a pedicle screw or a cage, right? The key thing about deformity is understanding various pelvic parameters, is understanding tricky things, such as if they've already had two different types of pelvic fixation that have become loose, and you need to know a third pelvic fixation or backup plans. It's also important to be comfortable with PSOs. I think at the very least being PSOs. Look, you don't need to graduate fellowship and be great at a VCR or something like that, but it'd be great to get exposure to all those things. That's where deformity comes in. But again, the best thing for deformity is to know that if you're not fixing a deformity, you're creating a deformity, and having a fellowship that has an understanding of that also is a really uh, critical aspect to kind of the future of spine care. Okay, so again, these aren't necessarily ranked in order of importance, but one of the things that I was um, somewhat struggling with and couldn't figure out how important it was at the time was the program or household name recognition. And look, I kind of think this is debatable. This could be important, this could not be important. You might have an advantage of going to a very well-known um, household name, prestigious place in your first 18 months of practice, in your first couple of years from a marketing standpoint, because you know who knows that name? Really, it's your patients. Maybe it's your primary care providers. But most people don't know what these programs are. And I use the example of, look, say you were a spine fellow at Princeton or MIT. Well, I'm sure your parents are going to be really proud about that because that sounds really smart. You know, MIT, oh my gosh, you're, you graduated from MIT. How great is that? But there's no spine programs there. So that's just not a real thing, but it sounds really cool, right? And that could be the same thing. I, I think Rothman Orthopedic Institute is an example. I know this might hurt Dr. Vaccaro's ears, but you know, if you live in Texas, if you live in California, you probably have never heard of Rothman in your life. And so while as an orthopedic resident, and especially someone in spine, we know that that's considered a pretty darn good program. Most patients have never heard of Rothman before. They probably think I went to some community program down the street. So the household name is something that could be important, could not be important. It kind of just depends. Maybe it's important for your first couple of years, just building your brand, saying, oh, I'm a MIT trained spine surgeon. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about outcomes. It's all about getting good exposure. 
you know, you'd hope once you get five, six, seven years in, almost all your referrals are from other patients and they're from good outcomes. And so that's kind of the key thing is getting a good training. So it could be an important factor, but really after you get more years under your belt, it should become less of a factor. And it's really all about your training and good clinical outcomes. So with that, I'd like to thank SSF once again for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. I think it's really important. The thing I just want to remind everybody is, look, there's a lot of really good programs out there. There could be up to 20 good programs out there. It's all just based on what's good for you. Um, and there's no perfect program. There's some programs out there that are fantastic and they have very little trauma exposure, but they're still really good. There's some programs that have very little MIS, very little deformity, but they're still really good. There's not a perfect program. The other thing I just want to kind of stress is I wouldn't wait until you're four months, five months, even half a year in before you really appreciate how good you got it. Fellowship is great. Um, even if it doesn't check all those 10 boxes, fellowship's great. It's something where I wish I could go back and do it again because it was really fun. Yes, there, it's tough, but it's really fun. You're working with some of the great leaders in the field. You're working with some of your future best friends for life, and it's just a really great experience to be able to see these complex cases. Um, it's all about what you think you're gonna be doing later in life. But again, you don't know if you're gonna be in an academic job, if you're gonna be in a trauma heavy job, if you're gonna be the deformity guy for your group or guy or girl for your group. So I think it's just really important to get a broad exposure. You don't know exactly what your practice is gonna be like or even where you're gonna be living five years after fellowship. Uh, I just thank SSF once again for allowing me to talk about this. My contact information's at the bottom. If anyone wants to kind of reach out and ask about certain programs, um, about four years removed from it. So still remember some, um, fresh enough to remember some, but not too far out to where I don't remember anything. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone once again for taking the time to listen to this and reach out if you have any additional questions.